Welcome to the very first breakout session of the 2020 Women of Power Summit. Um, and it's going to be a good one. Working while black, overcoming microaggressions, racial bias, and the burnout that comes from it. I'm Elisa Gums. I'm the executive managing editor at Black Enterprise. And we're so happy to have you and our panel here. I'm just going to get right into introductions so that we can get to the good stuff. We have Karen S. Carter, the Chief Human Resources Officer and Chief Inclusion Officer for Dow Chemical Company. Please welcome Karen. <laughs> then we have Minda Hartz, who is CEO of the Memo LLC, a career development platform. I don't even have to finish hers. <laughs> a career development platform for women of color and author of the Memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table. And then we have Sandra Sims Wilson, the Senior Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Nielsen. Please welcome all of them. So ladies, I think every woman in this room probably has a story of working while black. Um, and we could be here for the next two days just talking about the stories. But before we get into solutions, I think it's really important to ground the conversation in in the reality of what we go through. So do either of any of you women have a personal story that you want to share of, of an experience that you had working while black? Okay, so I'll start. I don't normally do that um, because I'm an <laughs> introvert. Um, but the one story I will share is when I was, it was later in my career. It was not at the beginning uh, because I pretty much thought I had it. Um, it was when I got to the point that I was going to be named the uh, HR director. And I really was the next in line. And they skipped. Mm -hmm. And I had been in the organization over 10 years. And I was like, wait a minute, what is going on? It was one of those rare moments in your career where you say, what the hell? <laughs> now, I felt that I had presented myself in such a way that why wouldn't I get it? I had the experience. I was actually the director of employee relations at the time, working with the HR director, who was actually promoted to managing director. And she called me in and said, um, we're looking for someone who has more experience. You know, they moved the numbers for you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. So they were supposed to go outside. And what they did was they actually promoted someone inside who had no experience. And I was really floored. I mean, that one took me out uh, because I had been very, you know how we are, we're very loyal. Very loyal to the organization, to the leadership, et cetera. Um, my buddy was the CEO. So when that happened, it was a major wake up call that you can go along and get along, and it doesn't matter. And when they want to put someone in that's their friend or looks like them and they feel better about that person, they will do it. Uh, but unfortunately for them, that was really like a lawsuit. <laughs> no, no, we're talking about HR. So it was really kind of like asinine, like you did the wrong thing to the wrong person. And I didn't get that angry. I just thought, you're stupid. And I'm not, I, I really had to reassess who I was in that moment. And I thought, OK, so I'm a nice person. I'm pretty level-headed. But this ain't going down like this. Yeah. And so I did what I needed to do. I did not go legal on them. I waited for my CEO, because they did not tell him that they were doing this. And so I really had him in my back pocket. And he did the investigation. He, had, he got someone external. I, I'm telling you the details, because that's what you have to do. Um, I did count, seek counsel. I sought a co an executive coach. Um, my CEO sat two hours with me to tell me that person was not my friend. So what they had to do, because they'd already made the offer to the person, is that they had, had to follow through. And I was to actually stay in the job I had and work with that person. Now, by the way, I didn't have a problem with it because I also knew she was going to fail. And it was not <laughs> going to be at my behest. 
it was because she didn't have the intelligence to do the job. And so they had to wait for all of this to process out. But in the meantime, I was then asked if I wanted to do three different jobs. They made offers for three different jobs, and the one that I took was director of diversity because I said to him, the CEO, this will never happen to another person. Now this is about following through on what happens to you and how you can build from it. And certainly from that point on, I have built from that day to help others and to make sure that they are uh, not overlooked. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing that. I, I think many of us probably have similar experiences, but we don't go the full distance, right? So thank you for leaning into that. I'm gonna tell a story early in my career because what I find is working while black is some of those early experiences, they still stick to us. Yeah. And they cut, and you don't realize after a thousand cuts how much trauma you have taken on as a black woman in the workplace. And it was the first job that I took in corporate America and I was picking up my boss from um, the airport with another colleague because I got in earlier. So I said, you know, I'll get the car. I was actually a day ahead and I had a uh, orange fingernail polish on, burnt orange. And I was dressed up professionally and um, long story short, my boss jumps in the car who happens to be a white man and my colleague is another white man and he says, you people love your bright colors. And then he went on to make jokes about it for the next 15 minutes with my colleague about how black people love bright colors. And I'm sitting in the car, driving, mind you, <laughs> and uh, in that moment, I didn't know what to do. I mean, for 15 minutes, you're laughing like it's comedy night at the Apollo about how black people like bright colors, but the last time I checked, Crayola didn't make a, an addition of bright crayons for black people, and so I didn't know what to do. And in that moment, I started to tell myself, Oh, Bob, he didn't mean any harm. But what I realized, as many more times as he went on to say s silly things, ignorant things, racist things like that, I would then tell myself he didn't mean any harm. But then 15 years later, I realized how much harm it actually did. Yeah. And I often replay that conversation and many others in my head on a reel, like, darn it, I should have said something. Because we go back to our desk, we go back and we play it on a reel, and we really badger ourselves for not saying anything. And I often wonder, had I had said something in that moment or any other time, maybe he wouldn't make another black woman feel bad about her bright colors again. And that's when I realized that I had to eventually start speaking up and lean into my courage and, le um, and let it trump that fear because it's not just about me. I don't want the next woman of color to have to go through that same thing. And so it's really important that we lean into having those conversations, even if we are one of the only ones, because we want to make it better for the next black woman to come in the, in the room. No, I mean, I think it's a good point. And because we are in the room, we have an obligation. Um, and so there's nothing like um, educating in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at Dow, you know, we're, we're a chemical company, material science company, um, largely white male industry. We make stuff. Right, so we make plastics, we make chemicals. Um, and I've been in, in, on the business side for most of my career. I've been there for 26 years, but most of it um, has been on running businesses. And I can remember when I got what I thought was my dream job. I was running the largest business in the largest region. I had made it. They had never had an African-American, let alone an African-American female in that job. But most importantly, I was in Houston where it was warm. <laughs> and I was where my babies were and my grandbabies were. That was really critical for me. And then one day I got a call from the CEO. And um, he says, um, I've got a job offer for you. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking it's running another business. And he says, we're going to name our first ever chief inclusion officer. And I hesitated. Because I've been doing the diversity my entire career. And I'm thinking, y'all not serious. Don't waste my time. I have no interest in being the token anything. Uh, my authenticity is not for sale. Um, and that's not my path. It's not my path. Um, and, and does anybody have a crew? You know what a crew is? If you don't have a crew, get a crew. Um, you can call it a crew, a personal board of directors, whatever, because you need somebody that's going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Um, and I'm extremely blessed um, to have a mentor who happens to be in the room, sent Marshall. Um, and she gave me a call, and she said, I got a lot of time, um, but you need to take that because it's not about you. And if you really wanna make a difference, you have to be in the room and at the table. 
And it, it is because I trusted her, because she could see the movie, I could only see the scene, and quite frankly, I was being quite selfish, uh, because it was, it was very, um, it, it helped my ego to be able to say that I was running the biggest business in the biggest region and making most of the EBITDA for the company. That's what I really liked. But in order for me to get to where I am now, the first African-American female officer in the company, and that's not about me either. That's not about me either. I had to take this step. So now that I am in the room, I have a real opportunity to stop it where it is. Not an opportunity, I have an obligation. Uh, you know, because there's a, there's a saying, and I'll cut it short. Um, one, of the, one of the George Washington Carver's, one of his great quotes, and I'm not gonna say it, it, it perfectly, but please go look it up. And it goes something like this. No man, and I will add, or woman, has any right to come in or go out of this world without leaving behind him, and I will add, or her, distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through here. Distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through here. So this is my distinct and legitimate reason for passing through here is having the courage, stepping up to the plate, living through my purpose. I didn't choose the purpose, the purpose chose me and making sure that because I'm there that I send the elevator back down every day. Yeah. We're gonna come back around to what our responsibility, um, what our responsibility is um, later. But before we attack the problem, we have to name it. And so I just wanna go through um, some stats here from a lean in study on microaggressions and the things that black women over index in, um, which is all of them. So 40% of black women have said they've had their judgment questioned 42% said they've needed to provide more evidence of their competence. 26% said they've been addressed in a less than professional way. 22% have said they've been mistaken for someone at a lower level. 22% have said they've had their work contributions ignored. And 19% have said they've heard demeaning remarks about them or people like them. And that's just in microaggressions. When you also expand it to bias, black women have said that their managers are less likely to help them navigate office politics, and they're less likely to socialize with them outside of work. So that's a whole like laundry list of things. But we, could just, we can just end right there. <laughs> <laughs> but are there things that are, that are missing from here um, that you guys think are, are really important issues facing black women today in terms of bias or microaggressions in the workplace? Well, of course. Um, and I think that the, the best cure is to have m more of us there. Uh, we can address the culture. We can uh, make sure that everybody has a sense of belonging. We can, but, you know, and, and when we have the sister that walks down the hall with natural hair, more than one, mm -hmm. then you don't have to ask the question, is it okay for you to be here and have natural hair? Uh, when you can see yourself somewhere, and not just one or two people, but when you can see yourself at all levels of the organization, then you don't have to question if I really belong here. So that's why it's, it's incredibly important to focus on having more of us there. And not just us, a lot of people. You know, the, the Catalyst calls it the emotional tax. Mm -hmm. You know, some people call it covering. Um, imagine yourself bracing for something, tensing up, bracing. And imagine living in that every day. Uh, I haven't always been where I am in, in terms of my confidence. Uh, I wish I was 20 years ago. I tell young, young black women in particular uh, that all the time because I think about the sacrifices that I made. And when somebody would say something to me, like mistake me for somebody at a lower level, if there's an inkling of me that believes that, then it hurts. But if I don't really believe that about myself, then return to cinder, right? So, so it, it's important to, to I mean, I. I went to Howard University, I know who I am. I got a degree, but I got an education in who I am at Howard. Um, but this imposter syndrome is real. It's real. And so we have to make sure that we know who we are. We have to make sure that we walk in that every day. We have to make sure that, that we know where to go when that moment happens. Um, but educate in the moment. I was on my way to Davos. I was in the line for first class because I get upgraded all the time. And I'm getting on the plane with 200 of my closest friends uh, going to Switzerland. And I'm 10th in line, 7th or 10th in line from the front. And the airline uh, employee 
walked all the way to me and said, ma'am, I think you're in the wrong line. Now, I had a couple of choices to make because I didn't grow up, you know, with social media, so I had to remember that I could be on YouTube or Twitter at any moment. <laughs> and I do work for Dow, and again, I always want to make Scent proud. So I had two lanes to choose, but back to educating in the moment. I looked at her square in the eye and said, what makes you think that? And I'm real comfortable with the pregnant pause. Like, we'll stand here all day. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it made me sad for her because there was nothing in her mind or her life that said somebody that looked like me could ever be in first class. So educating in the moment, I believe I needed to be, I should be in first class. I, be, I did. So I didn't shrink away. I didn't say, well, well, maybe I am. You know, let me look at my ticket again. No, I'm supposed to be in first class. And then educate in the moment because there's a reason you think that. And, that, and that's, that's the sad part. And I think that's what, and it's exhausting, but it's where we are. Well, I'm going to piggyback on two things you said. Uh, one is courage, and two is the natural hair piece. Um, in the advertising business, which I just left, uh, the natural hair piece obviously is a conversation. And people are coming into work looking whatever they want to, wearing their hair in, in any way they want to. And we had to address it. Now, mind you, I just want you to know I'm from a different generation, so I didn't know what this was all about. And meaning that I didn't know people were walking up to others, asking about their hair, having a complete conversation about their hair. Like, who, who does that? <laughs> so I, no one had ever done that to me in my career. So I was like, why, why are we having a conversation about hair? Uh, and this was when Trump had just gotten uh, elected. And so I said, I think we got a, a little bit more important issues to talk about than hair. They, they've been touching <laughs> hair before Trump, though. Yes. <laughs> Well, yes, but I didn't know that. So as the older person in the room, I said, okay, well, we'll do this panel. And uh, quite frankly, 130 people showed up, mostly white. And they stayed with us for two hours in conversation. Now, one of the, um, the clients that we had was L'Oreal. So the L'Oreal team came. And there's, they, they wanted to have conversation about, you know, why do you want to touch my hair? Um, why do you ask about my hair? Now, something did come out of this, by the way, is that um, because we can change our hair on a dime, um, they don't recognize us. And they, they will call, no, no. No, this is true, this is true. They will call you some, by somebody else's name and say, oh, I'm, no, that's not me, I'm Sandra because they don't know. We, we change our hairstyle and that means we change our whole look. Now look, that's happened to me too, so okay? Uh, you, we need to understand that. And this is about education. You have to educate people as much as I have heard uh, young people tell me, I'm sick of talking to them about uh, me. Why do I have to keep educating them about me? Well, because we are in their play pen. That's why. We have to continue to educate people because otherwise they won't know. Um, the courage to do that is what I'm asking yeah. of you. Yeah. Have the courage to do that. I don't mean putting your hands on your hips and, and you know, having that attitude. It means that you just actually have a conversation. A so difficult you ask, one. You, know, you, yeah. Said, yeah. you ask me about my hair. So and also, have, let me tell uh, you how that makes me feel, right? Yeah. So when you, when <laughs> you, when you do here. that, <laughs> mm -hmm. or when you said that, let me tell you how yeah. that makes me feel. Mm -hmm. When you say that historically black colleges and universities are less than, did you know that I went to one? And then let me educate you on mm -hmm. all the great mm -hmm. people that came through there. And let me tell you how that makes me feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I'm gonna take it from a, a different perspective a little bit because I do think, yes, if you, you have the option, right? I think that we have options. If you feel like you have the, that you wanna educate, then I think that's great. But also know that you don't have to either, right? There is some onus. When we enter the workplace, nobody gives us a manual on etiquette. We figure it out, right? And I think we have to push our um, so-called allies to figure it out too. And it was one reason why I wrote the memo uh, is because yes, I wanted us to see ourselves and know that we weren't alone experiencing these hair touching mm -hmm. moments or getting confused with Keisha, you know, and all these different things. But, but the other thing was letting them into what it's like. So I wrote the book so that 
when we do get tired, for us that are tired, we can give it to them. Why don't you go check out the memo? Did, you obviously didn't get the memo, right? So <laughs> let's, let's, you read that and then come back and talk to me. And a lot of white men and women will read the book and they'll email me or um, something and they'll be like, oh my God, I had no idea that you guys didn't like your hair touch or that you didn't like this, that, and the other. And I said, okay, well, I'm sure you've heard it before, but if you, now what are you going to do with it? Because we can have courageous conversations and critical conversations, and it took me a long time to do that. It was small acts of courage. I wasn't like Beyonce and woke up overnight and was able to, you know, say what I said, what I said moments with, with them. But, but then the other part of it is encouraging our allies or those who consider themselves allies to be courageous listeners. Because if I tell you that I don't like you doing this, then I don't want to hear you say you're taking it the wrong way. Let's create that space to have a dialogue. And so I think that's the issue, us not being dismissed when we do lean into it. So I really would like to, for them to be more courageous listeners. So when I do tell you that I don't like it, that I now reframe my mind and say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about how it landed on you because now I'm centering myself. Karen brought up the emotional tax earlier. Um, and there is a cost to black women, as you said. You don't realize that you've been getting all these cuts over the years and how harmful it is at the end. We're going to talk about strategies to get ourselves out of these situations, but sometimes you're stuck in the situation. And while you are, how do you minimize the damage? I know, Minda, you wrote in your book that you went through a year where you had panic attacks over you know, your work situation. So how do we take care of ourselves in the situation? I took a job from Los Angeles to the East Coast. It was my dream job. And I had more money, the title, all the things, right? And when I got to this situation, I had always been the only one, so it wasn't a new experience, but it was a more blatantly racist experience because before it was very subtle, right? Um, they were smiling and saying it, but now they were frowning and saying it. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I didn't realize, I started to question my own worth and if I belonged here and it started to really break me down by the time I left I didn't even recognize myself anymore they say bring your authentic self to work well whose version of authenticity are we talking about now and so I lost myself in that moment and unfortunately I had to mourn that person because that career that I once had it died that day because I had to leave a year later and it's unfortunate that a lot of us have to give up our dreams for bad characters in the workplace, and it's so important why we have these conversations. But what I realized was, in that moment why I was getting my advanced degree and trying to make this thing work, because we don't have to make everything work, but I was telling myself that I did. And so one of the things that I did is I realized that I, I had options, and I had to strategize to get out of that situation. And I stood up for myself. I did all the things. But at the end of the day, I knew that I was never going to have my seat at the table in the way that I deserved. And it required me to leave. At that, that particular table. At that particular table. But there was another table for me. And so I want to encourage everyone to know that maybe it's not where you are. But we sometimes have to have those hard conversations with yeah. ourselves. You, you guys, this is real. Um, there's research that says... Uh, that this emotional tax, the whatever you want to, it has real physical implications. Sleep deprivation. Uh, if you have a, a dormant uh, medical issue, it, 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 will, it will emphasize that. Um, so, and there are, are real mental implications. And, and we don't talk about mental health as much as we should because we always make the leap to mental illness. But your mental health is at stake if we don't address this. And, and so I, I talked about the crew and, and we kind of all laughed, but it is absolutely critical. It's the center. Now for me, it's, it's faith for sure. Uh, and I am quick to say this ain't worth it for real. Um, it's not worth my sanity. It's not worth my family. Um, I know who I am. But when you get in those moments, because we will, we will get in those moments. And I remember when I became um, an, an officer of the company and a, a group of ladies down in Texas took me to dinner. One, one is here. And I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. We're just going to kind of celebrate. And they gave me something that I have in my office. And, it, and they had hands on it and said, we got you covered. And every now and, and again, and another one sitting here, I'll get a text that says, I'm just thinking about you today. Or, girl, you have some bad shoes on today. <laughs> or... Uh, your hair wasn't quite right. It's not quite right. You need to tighten, you need to tighten that up. Uh, but to have a place that I can go to 
and, and be who I am um, and ask for what I need or for people to tell me what I need and I don't know that I need it, uh, that's important. And, and being vulnerable mm -hmm. and being willing to say, this is, this is where I am. Um, unfortunately, I had one of my mentors who, who isn't uh, an African-American woman commit suicide. And that day changed my life. Because the way I looked at him, he had it all made. He had the boat and the money and the, all that. And the day that the company said, your services are no longer needed. So I, I'm, I'm on a mission that this is not my life. This is what I do, but this is not who I am. Mm -hmm. so, so finding that center and visiting that center all the time and the crew, I mean, I'm going to say it over and over again, the, the crew is critical. I will say that um, the situation that I described uh, was a rude awakening. And I did mourn, uh, but I didn't go down. I was um, backed up by my crew. The first is Jesus Christ. And as a believer, I was, going, I was attending Sunday school at the time. I told my Sunday school class, and you know it takes, takes an old saint to come up to you. And she, <laughs> and she came up to me and she says, you know what, just be quiet, it'll be okay. Now the next day is when they gave me the offers for the three different jobs. And she said, the Lord is watching over you. Now when a saint comes, you, you have to pay, pay attention to what she says, and I was quiet. Um, I believe that we go through things for reasons. And because of that incident, I sit here today. So I have to work through those things with my crew, those who I can call and say, this isn't working. But he's working through me and you. So hang in there. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that? That's really great. Um, I, I think it's so, in the book I call it a squad, but it's all the same, right? And what I realized was that for about the first year that I was going through this situation, I didn't tell my crew I, didn't, I wasn't vulnerable. How, how often do we not want to tell people that we're hurting, that this isn't working out? We don't want to admit that sometimes. And I did myself a disservice by trying to be the strong black woman and not letting everybody know that this was hurting the people that needed to know. But I thought I could handle it myself. And um, Audre Lorde, she has this really great quote that I live by, and it says, beware of feeling like you're not good enough to deserve it. And... It, and it's so important that we remind ourselves and recreate the narrative that we want for ourselves each and every time, no matter if we do have those moments that, that knock us down. Yeah. As we talk about squads and crews and faith, um, those are always of enlisting help. And I want to talk about some strategies of enlisting help in the workplace. Um, because, Sandra, you mentioned that when this all happened, they didn't know that you had your CEO on your side. Um, and so, you know, we've mentioned allies a little bit. I know some people um, have a hard time with that word. <laughs> you, you said so-called allies. Um, but how do we make those kinds of relationships with the people at work who can help us through these things without sort of, you know, feeling like we're sounding the alarm that woe is me, or I'm being treated differently, or it's a race thing. You know, a lot of times people don't want to say that. Well, I have always built relationships, um, and I guess that was part of going through this, that I knew that I had built relationships where people respected me, and they knew who I was. The one thing that stood out in that incident is that people kept talking about my integrity. And so when they looked at my integrity and said, that's the balance of who that person is, and they didn't understand why that other person got the job, that was, that was my, that's kind of like your legacy, your integrity. Um, I do believe that sometimes we do not do enough in building relationships. One, because it's that fear of not trusting yeah. and that they're not authentic uh, and that this is, this is not real, so I'm not going to waste my time having lunch with this person. I don't know how many of you have heard from Carla Harris, but the truth is you do have to build relationships. Um, I had the relationship with my CEO because he came to my office on the balance of people telling him, you can trust Sandra. So when that happens, then you, you've got someone you can count on. And I, by the way, I did educate him 
in that incident, he really had to be educated because mm -hmm. he just did not realize that people were mm -hmm. racist and stupid like that. Mm -hmm. He was living in his own bubble. Mm -hmm. So you have to, edu you do have to take the time to educate people. Absolutely. No, I, just, just a couple of things. I think, I think that's really important. I think you have to get people to experience things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I asked her if I could say this and she said I could. Uh, so we, we've been coming here for, for, for several years, and, and we generally bring 10 to 15 women. Um, and I always bring one woman that's not African-American. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to take over. It's always going to be the Black Enterprise Women of Power Summit. But I need them to experience it. Mm -hmm. And so last year, I brought my, two years ago, I brought my communications director. And I said, you can't write for me unless you understand me. Mm -hmm. And she came. And I was, I didn't come that year. And I said, she'll be all right. And of course, then I called everybody else and said, make sure she's all right. <laughs> make, make sure the child is okay. Um, and she came back. And first of all, she said, Donna Brazil's my new BFF. She bought all the books. She did all of that. But then she was on the elevator with our CEO. And she tweeted out. And she said, I wanted to be really respectful and careful what I tweeted out because I realize I'm not the target audience. And so he follows her on Twitter. And he said, hey, you been anywhere interesting lately? She was like, what do you mean? He said, no, no, have you been anywhere interesting lately? And she's like, oh, yeah. I went to Black Enterprise, and let me tell you, did you know that white women make 80 cents on a dollar, but African-American women make 60, 60 to 61 cents? And he said from floor one to floor six, she, she educated him <laughs> the experience. And she said, Karen, I've never been in a room where I was the only. And I said, Allison, welcome to my every day. <laughs> so this year... You know, fortunately, I have another colleague that works with me that's here. And I asked her in the hallway, how's it going? What do you think so far? She said, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> she said, because you've been telling me this, but I didn't quite understand. And she said, I'm not sure if people are mad that I'm here or if they're okay that I'm here, um, but I'm learning so much. So we have to create, I know it's not our job, but when we feel like it, we have to create those experiences for people, because I, I don't have time to wait for you to have a, a, a child that marries somebody black and then you have a biracial. <laughs> to care. I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of time. So, so, so we, I believe, yeah. have to create these experiences. Yeah. Uh, wait, ladies, this is being taped. Ladies, ladies, before you answer that, I'm going to ask you all to start lining up. If you have questions, we're going to start taking questions. Um, there are mics on either of the two okay, outside no, aisles, hers, I, um, and then you guys can continue. Yeah, well, I, and, I, and I think it can be yes and. Yes. I don't think that we don't have to educate. Like, I don't mind doing it, right? But I know that I don't want to put that burden on right. someone else. But one thing I will say, it is really building those relationships because being one of the only ones in every space all the time, I realized that while I was had my head down, working really hard, coming in late, staying, that all this other system was going on and it was relationship building. And I realized that Bob wasn't gonna come and tap me and be like, hey, Minda, what's up with you? I had to make sure Bob knew what was going on with me. But what I realized, you know, why Kim knew why Bob loved Red Velvet Cupcakes is because she went to happy hour. She went to do some of those things. So I realized that I needed to build relationships with Bob and people in HR and have my squad there in the workplace and it really helped and you think about Diddy he's a famous prophet you know Puff Daddy he said T tell my friends to get with my friends and we could be friends and that's how you create an environment inside the workplace and and it exponentially increased my seat my seat to getting to the table because now Bob was checking for me he knew me so when someone tried to say Minda you're aggressive you know Bob could say no I know Minda I can vouch for her so get you a Taylor Swift song at karaoke get in there and do it <laughs> <laughs> and and let's let's get these seats okay <laughs> okay ladies so we have a lot of questions I'm gonna ask you to be brief with your questions to ask one question and to get to the question Starting over here. Good morning, my name is Dara Smith. I have a background in engineering and technical support. And my question is about the pay gap in a very personal way. Those of you that have risen, where you inherit employees, white men especially, that make the same or more than you. And it's been pretty persistent as I've gone through layers of management. So I wanted to ask what your advice is and how you've ex experienced and dealt with that. 
So I read an uh, article recently that was just so disturbing to me, and it talked about the, the pay gap, particularly for black women, and that if we closed it, if we just closed it, again, 60 to 61 cents, depending on what research um, that you read compared to their white male counterparts, if we close that gap, we would have enough money to feed our families for 165 more weeks. We would have money for two and a half years of child care, two and a half years of child care, and we would be able to pay off our student debt in a year. Okay, so it's real. And it's, it's, it's absolutely critical that we do pay equity studies at a granular level. You have to get it, and you have to break it down by groups of people. You, you can't stay up here and think you're okay. You, you really have to go to the granular level. So, so the important thing is to elevate it when you see it, ha have the courage to bring it up and ask the question and say, so I'm just curious. I'm doing the same job as Joe. And, and by the way, transparency is the name of the game. Whether it's glass door, anyway, people know what you make. They know what you make. It just, it just is what it is. But, but having those conversations and saying, something, there's, there's something wrong here. And there's a difference between a bonus, you're paying me because of the way I performed this year, versus you're paying me for the job that I'm doing. That's right. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and my entire career, no, 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 that's not true, uh, 26 years. The last 15 years, I've already said, just pay me and fire me if I don't do the job. Like, like don't move me up and move me in and no, no, no. Because you're, you're going to measure me based on the full job. So just pay me and then if I don't perform, just fire me. And I'll just ha have to go do another job. But we have to have the courage to have those conversations. And the last thing I'll say is have the courage to negotiate. And we have a negotiation session later. We don't, we don't negotiate. Ha yeah. Do the negotiation. We'll take the next question over here. And I have a chapter in my book called No Money, More Problems. So go ahead and get yeah. that. <laughs> All about negotiation. Good morning. My name is Kenyatta Lewis, and I'm uh, an executive director here with MGM Resorts. I have a very personal question. So I've been with MGM for going on 20 years this year, and I've gone through uh, about four chief procurement officers. What advice would you have for me as someone who has longevity and a personal brand within the organization that goes throughout the nation and the chief procurement officers that come in and put a blocker um, and still try to steal your ideas, your identity, your relationships in order to elevate their own brand um, while suppressing you? So, <laughs> all of that is just pain. I, I'm not going to take that one because I want my room key to work later. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll work. I can use my influence to make sure it works. <laughs> so, Sandra's got it. So, I would say that you've been really patient. Really patient. I, and, and I don't want to get personal here, and we can take it off to the side, but you need to look at whether or not you are congruent with this organization. Yeah. And, and you know what? We, we all do it. We all do it. We stay. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And we stay because we are not feeling as secure venturing out. Uh, I did have to tell a room full of white males this at one point. I said, do you know why this room is like this? Because we do not move unless we know it's a sure thing. I said, because we are feeding more mouths than you know about. Mm -hmm. So it is a different scenario for us, and I certainly understand, but at some point, you're not, in a, in, in, you're not congruent to who you are staying in that kind of situation. And also, don't you think, because one other thing, I, know your options. Yeah. So, right. so st stay because you, you know your options. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the other thing I don't always see us do, and, and I'll, I'll say this, I, I explore my options. I have interviewed with other companies. I've stayed for 26 years because I've compared what I have to those options. And so the moment to execute, the moment that you have to execute your options isn't the moment to define them. Right. And just because you are exploring them doesn't mean you're not loyal, doesn't mean you want to leave, all these things that we put in our minds, but it's so important to understand your options so you know your worth. Yeah. And yet, knowing your worth is real important. It's real important. I just changed jobs after 28 years. And I have to tell you that people really thought I was going to retire. This is not retiring. And so therefore, I had, I had actually gone on interviews. I was testing myself because I'd gotten comfortable. 
but also knew it, I was not congruent to the, the uh, leaders that I was dealing with. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, it's, I'm too old to do that now. Okay. So don't do it even in your youth. You m must move on. There are jobs out there, by the way. There are. Yeah. <laughs> and we are looking for you. You know, where, you know how they say, we can't find them. Well, no, we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question over here. We've talked a lot about uh, emotional tax and uh, of education. And so I'm personally over educating people. I'm had enough, but I recognize that I have an obligation to do so. So how do you gauge when someone is genuinely interested in the education or just giving you a kind of lipstick on a pig kind of thing of I pretend I want to know, but I really don't want to know. I don't care. So how do you gauge that? Well, for, for me, it's been interesting because I've been on the road for six months with the book, and so I have a lot of white men and women who say they want to learn, right? And I, so I say, this is great. Read the book. There's a chapter in the back called For White Readers, and it's called <laughs> no, no More Passes. So, <laughs> so, so here's what I need you to do. But um, the thing for me is now that you know... I want to see what, six, what your partnership with me looks like or the partnership in your organization looks like so that you, we have some receipts, right? That we're not always coming back to, I told you six months ago not to touch my hair, you're back at it again, right? So it's like um, making sure that there's some receipts, some tangible things that can be um, attached to it. And I think that, again, for me, I don't mind the education because, again, if, we're not, if it's not for me, then I don't know who it's going to be. But I give them resources. You know, I teach a class at NYU, and I, and I tell majority of my classes uh, Caucasian, and I say to them, how much of your workforce do you want to use? You have all of these women of color in your workforce. So it's a pun it's and 70% of women of color say that their managers are not invested in their success. So you actually have um, privilege to be able to share and benefit these women of color. So how are you investing in them? And so I look to see the track record, right? And so I think, again, it's going to be like, okay, now that we've had the conversation, now what? And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the receipts and giving them the resources that they need to succeed. But I hope that more of them will come in spaces um, where we're speaking so they can hear it. Because when they tell me that they're an ally, but then I never see them in the spaces that we're at, or they never put any risk in the game, then I don't believe it. So until I see you uh, in it for real, then I know that you're a success partner. Your allyship is moving into action. So it's that visual. You kind of know, right? <laughs> you, you know, you know because they did something different yes. at the end of the day. It's, it's what they do. And, and, and my team will tell you all the time I talk about there's a couple different kinds of people. The ones that get it, the ones that don't get it but they want to, and the ones that don't really want to get it. We're not going to spend time on them. Yeah. You know? But as a company, we have to deal with them. Right? So we have to deal with the leaders who are not going to get in the boat. And it's okay, but you can't be here. And so I would just say to all of the people that have that responsibility and opportunity, yeah, we can educate and do all of that, but the company has to deal with the leaders that are not going to align with the culture that you say you want. At the end of the day, the people, leaders, managers, whatever you want to call them, those are the ones that have the most impact. Those are the ones. And so we have to hold them accountable with both positive and negative consequences, and it's okay, but then you can't be here, and that, and we focus a, a lot on that, and saying that, you know, because you know them, Pe your organization knows them, and the longer you don't deal with them, it doesn't matter what you say, you can have the best inclusion and diversity, all the stuff, the stuff, the posters, and, you know, all the conferences, and do all of that, but until you deal with Joe, yeah. it doesn't matter, yep. or Jill, okay, we're going to take the question over here, Hello, my name is Mildred Black Hooks, and I am the founder of People Optimum Consulting. I spent my career in uh, HR leadership. In the last decade, I uh, relocated back home to Alabama, West Alabama, and faced uh, what I would say was some of the most significant racism, micro and macro aggression that you could imagine in the workplace. And I was the first to ever be in, an, in a, a director position in the organization, backdrop. So now here I am, I'm an entrepreneur, I founded this company. What would you say to an entrepreneur who is uniquely positioned almost to the point of being a black unicorn in West Alabama, what would you say to that person um, when they are facing people who uh, are intimidated by your confidence, they take it that you're proud or entitled, 
um, some who also want to do the business with you because they know it's the right thing to do. But what would you say to a person to navigate the waters of the people who are thrown off by your confidence just because you know your stuff? You know, this stuff makes my head hurt. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to be in a space where I have to do all of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I was, have all my career been told about my overconfidence. Um, I did have a white male coach who said to me, take it down a notch. Now, taking it down a notch meant the voice, the face, mm -hmm. all of that. Because the truth is, you do want to attract and not repel. Sure. And sometimes, you know, we can put our hands on our hips and kind of go that way, but you can't. Uh, and you can't even do that with us. Mm -hmm. Because we are not a monolith. We are different people. Mm -hmm. So we do have to have that introspection about, is this the situation? Is this the person that I really do want to do business with? Mm -hmm. So that's something you, you're going to have to pick up. And I'll tell you what session you need to go to, and that's Linda Clemens this afternoon. She's my mentor. Linda Clemens yeah. is amazing. Yes. yes. I'm going to take a question over here. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Lindsay Cornelius, um, Associate Director of Talent Engagement Inclusion at Digitas. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Um, you all talked a lot about learning to speak in the moment when you experience things, whether they're macro, micro, whatever that is. Do you have advice on how to speak after the moment for those of us who maybe don't know how to speak in or forget or you get caught off guard? How do you address it afterwards? Go back. Yeah. Go back. <laughs> Just go back. Circle back. Mm -hmm. um, and, and practice. So, so I actually have people like practice. Let's practice what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you know, don't cry. So you don't um, say something that you don't want to say. Like write it down, practice, but mm -hmm. go back. Uh, because it, it, it's, so, it's so important for people to understand the implication of their words. Mm -hmm. Because words absolutely matter. Um, I mentioned the, the person that stood up and said, hey, historically black, you know, I, we shouldn't go there anymore because we're hiring people that are less than and so on and so forth. And so I, I said it in the moment, I didn't want to embarrass him, but then I circled back mm -hmm. and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation because I wanted to understand, did you, do you just not know? You know, yeah. I, I assume ignorance. And so, and I don't mean that I know, you just don't know. So. I'm, I'm going to make sure you know. Um, or is it a uh, racist bias? Because that, that happens. Listen, we, companies are a microcosm of our society. Mm -hmm. And they don't check that stuff at the gate. And I want to know when it, I don't want you to suppress it. Like, I want to be able to see it so we can, we can deal with it. But always go back. And don't go back just for you. Go back for all the rest of us. Because they're thinking that anyway. Uh, and, and it's important to have a, a, a knowledgeable conversation in a constructive manner, uh, but always, always go back. Go back. Lean into that courage. It, it takes small acts of courage, and you might not, you might, and don't beat yourself up if you miss that opportunity, but go back on it again. And, and again, if it hurts, if you're thinking about it the next morning mm -hmm. and it's still sitting there, then yep. it, you, again, Audre Lorde said, beware of feeling like you're not good enough to deserve it. Go back and have that conversation. And even if they say, oh, that's not what I meant, it, it's about you in that moment, right? You getting it and letting them know because maybe yeah. they'll deal with you a little bit better and you'll move a little bit different because you said it that one time and, and it'll get easier as it goes. Yep. I'd also add to that, um, read her book but also give the person the book. I have a book list, so you can't really get out of my office unless I give you that book list because you need it. Because uh -huh. I know you probably need to educate yourself in the closet, so it's fine. But please read some books and then come back and we can have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Smith and I work in sports marketing. Um, particularly, I work in golf. I am over consumer marketing for I'm learning a how to play golf. Golf, yay! We need more well, but African Americans in golf. Mm -hmm. um, but I work in consumer marketing. I'm over consumer marketing for a golf magazine. I am the only African American mm. on the staff, mm -hmm. and and definitely heading up, you know, in a, a department. But my question is, um, how do you build alliances? I'm in an industry where there's few 
African Americans, mm -hmm. period. Um, but how do you build alliances um, within an organization when it's only you? Because I know that I will have to, if I want to stay there or grow there, mm -hmm. I will have to have some. So how do you build alliances with people who don't look like you? Exactly. You know, the, uh, I'm, I'm always reading things. Um, a, a, another report that I read recently that said that, I, I won't get the numbers right, I think it's 85% of African Americans uh, only have African Americans in their social networks, and it's like 75% for Caucasians. I have the numbers transposed, but you, you get the point. Um, it, it's, it's, for me, in my life, it's really important to have a diversity in every aspect of, of my being, um, because I believe in the value of that. I do. Uh, my crew is diverse. Uh, and so I think it, it, it's not hard, it's like it's not, it's not hard. Um, and, and, it, and, and by the way, some of the sisters that I know aren't on my team, are not rooting for me. And it hurts, it hurts, but I know it. And so, and so we also shouldn't assume, and you're not saying this, but we also shouldn't assume that there aren't some white people that should be in our crew. And so, you know, we just have to, to extend. Um, I think sometimes they're afraid to extend. Uh, we don't always have to make the, the first move. I think that they, but, but make yourself available. Uh, you know, ask for mentoring, set up the meetings, get on the calendar, learn how to play to golf, I'm a slow learner. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, that we, I would just implore everybody you, you Look in your social networks and see how diverse or, or not they are. Yeah. You'd be surprised what um, people are thinking and make an approach to someone who, I made an approach to a white male that, of the leadership team who I, eh, mm -hmm. but I said, let's have lunch. <laughs> no, he was a hard, he's a hard, uh, you know, he was just hard nosed and we had lunch and I just asked him some questions. I said, do, what do you know about me? So now, by the way, be ready for the answers. Um, but we had a very good lunch because he told me, he says, you know, I know that you do your job, but I don't know too much about you, which I think is an issue. He said, and I think that you're a respectable, respectable person, but if you want to get ahead, you need to know more people that can root for you. Whoever mm -hmm. has what you need, yeah. you need to know them. Mm -hmm. And, and I was in this space, too, for 15 years as the only one, and it required getting to know. And it may not have been when I went to the happy hours or the break room birthday parties that I didn't want to go to, but I talked to the people that I need to, being strategic, not just networking for the sake of, but identifying and starting small and building your squad. So these are going to be the last two questions that we have coming up over here. Sorry, ladies, but go ahead. My name is Brala Dead. I'm an engineer with Dow, and the reason I stay is because of awesome people like Karen, Sint, Alvida, who just, I can see a future for the company with, so that done. Um, I want to ask about women allies. I know that's a topic that's rarely explored. Most times when people think allies, they're thinking white male. So for those of you on stage, has there been any white woman that has, have supported you, or have there been um, people you think don't get it. For example, I'm involved in my women's ERGs. I'm involved with uh, professional women's organizations like the Society of Women Engineers. And they roll out the board and everyone is white. And you start to wonder, did someone not see that this is supposed to be a diversity organization? What kind of education do you think they need and how do you think we can harness them? And has there been anyone for you? Many cases we've done ourselves a disservice because people declare victory on diversity when mostly the, the beneficiaries have been white women. Uh, that's, that's a fact. Uh, um, we, we as black women have not benefited to the degree that we should have. Um, and black people in general are getting 10% of the degrees, but, but black, we have what, less than 1% um, black CEOs uh, in the Fortune 500. When really, I mean, just do the math, we should have about 50. Uh, and so, you know, we, white women, period, um, I think we, we, have to, we have to convert them to allies. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's just a fact. And back to the experiences, et cetera. And, and some will get on board and, and, and some won't get on board. But let's not forget this. And I've been wanting to say this, so I'll just take this moment to say this. Um, and it's not my quote, so it, it's not. Don't give me credit for it. But someone said before, and it, it really rang for me, for people that have, have experienced privilege, 
inclusion, diversity, and equity will feel like oppression to them. Yeah. So I'll just say it again for a fact. People that have privilege, inclusion, diversity, equity, equality, whatever, we're, will feel like oppression to them. And so it, it's really important for us to anticipate that and to be able to deal with it and then convert those that we can into allies or advocates or whatever word you need. But let's not be confused. We have not benefited from diversity and inclusion programs so far. It's why you have to have targeted efforts. You cannot be afraid to talk about race in the workplace. You can't be afraid to have a program for black women. It's why we come to Black Enterprise, Women of Power Summit, for black women. That's why we do it. It's why we have a sponsorship program for black people. And some companies are afraid to do that, but that's our opportunity. Why am I gonna work on this over here when that's not my opportunity? So I think we gotta be courageous enough to get specific if you really believe in the value, in the value proposition of, of diversity and inclusion. And again, a lot of people talk a good game, but they're really not, they're not doing anything. And it's what I would call acupuncture action. Get specific and, and don't be afraid to do the things that you need to do in order to to close the gaps that you, that you have. But white women in particular, we've got to convert them into allies because they've been the, they've been the beneficiaries so far. We're in negative time, so we're gonna get the last question and in. And I won't answer, because then it'll be too long. <laughs> Good morning, ladies. My name is Ari Ledley, and my question is for Minda. Uh, what are your thoughts around code switching in the workplace? Yeah, that's a good one. And what? everyone can answer it too as well. I just wanted to start. <laughs> Yeah, I think it goes back to authentic, authenticity. Uh, oftentimes we're hearing this really buzzword of bring your authentic self to work, but if you've told me what name I'm supposed to use on the resume, how my voice is supposed to sound, how my hair is supposed to look, then in, you are entrenched in that for 15 plus, 20 plus, 30 plus years, it's really hard to show up as yourself because you don't know who that is. And so part of the book writing process was saying, what, how do we redefine who we want to show up as in the workplace? And you don't have to bring, you bring the pieces that you want of yourself. And for me, writing the memo was important because I was able to finally bring my authentic self to work. I talked about business acumen and I use rap lyrics and I use Beyonce and I still got the point home, right? But so I think that we can find those, but it goes back to what many of us said and it's relationship building. Once I built relationships with people, I felt more comfortable bringing different pieces, different intersections of myself. But what I realized after about 10 years is that what would it look like if I centered myself? If I maybe on some days didn't wear heels all the time, but I wore some really bad ass um, Nikes, right? Dunks to work, you know, those small little acts of courage. It doesn't take away my stats. I still am bringing it, but I just started to reframe and redefine who I wanted to be in the workplace because that's when I found joy. When you think about Kobe Bryant, depending, you don't have to like him or not, but he was lucky enough to do what he loved for 20 years. He was able to bring himself to work. And I hope for many of us black women while working that we also get to do that as well. So find those spaces that allow you to thrive and not just survive. On that note, please thank the women on this panel. They have been so open and, and so giving with their advice, and this has been amazing. Thank you, all of you.